The Passamaquoddy tribe is the uh, easternmost tribe in the United States. And since we're one of the first to greet each day, we're known as people of the dawn. And when I was growing up, I was told that as people of the dawn, it was our job to hold up the sky for the rest of mankind. That each Passamaquoddy had to stand up tall in order to do their part. So today I'm here holding my piece of the sky hoping to stretch a little taller to share some insight into the amazing resiliency and into the strengths and challenges of Wabanaki people. When I talk about Wabanaki people, I'm talking about the uh, Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot, the Mi'kmaq, and the Maliseet Indians here in our state. And even though I'm going to primarily talk about Passamaquoddy because that's part of who I am, you can find a lot of those same stories in all of those uh, tribal communities. I'm one of eight children that were shared between my parents. And I am the baby of the family, chronologically, but in many ways I have uh, grown into that elder role. And I contribute that to my mother and to my grandmother, who really shaped who I've become today. They modeled for me over, throughout my life amazing strength, confidence, and independence. The two of them together provided for the majority of the support for our family. They made beautiful Passamaquoddy baskets and they sold them across the state. They were two, two really amazing women. I spent a lot of time growing up with my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, and she was also very, very wise. And I was fortunate that she shared a lot of her knowledge with me, although sometimes it took me several years to realize the wisdom in her teachings. In addition to her basket making, she also operated a small one-room store out of her home. And it was a, like a mini convenience store that just had really the basics. And she had that store for about 26 years, and she rarely closed it. She would only close it if she had to take a quick errand to Perry or to Eastport. And that would only happen if she couldn't find someone to work for her. So holidays and weekends, for 26 years, if you can imagine, the store was open. She didn't interrupt whatever she was doing, whether it was making a basket, cooking a meal, eating a meal, in order to tend to the customers as they came in, except for one exception. When the priest came to pray with her, she would not interrupt what she was doing. I remember one particular day when, when I was 10 years old and the priest made one of his visits, and I was sitting quietly in the corner, kind of just watching, and a customer came in. And she looked over at me and she kind of motioned with her head for me to go out into the store and take care of this customer. And I can imagine the look on my face, you know, it was much of a shock and I shook my head, no. Um, and she motioned kind of again so that um, I would get up and go and I still shook my head, no. And so she get more and more distressed um, as time went on. So reluctantly I got up out of my chair and I went out into the store. Amazingly, I made it through that transaction. To this day, I have no idea whether or not I um, charged the right amount for the goods I sold, or if I even uh, gave them the right change. So when you think about that, at 10 years old, I became a storekeeper. So at you know, weekends, hot vacations, summers, I spent working with my, for my grandmother and helping her so that she can in turn help all of us. And when I think about that story, and it was a significant event um, in my life, it really reinforced a couple of major lessons for me. The first of which, both of my mother and my grandmother instilled in me very early on, was that I could do anything. That if I set my mind to it, I could do anything. Anything was possible. They're also quick to remind me that there's probably a whole lot I shouldn't do, but it wasn't because I couldn't do it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and this early um, store event was one of the, the real examples of that. It was terrifying for me to go out and to make that first sale, but I did it, much like she knew that I could. And it was one of her first lessons in resiliency. The, one of the other major lessons that she taught me was that in times in life, 
there were, going to be t there were going to be challenges and there were going to be things that were hard to do. But regardless of that they were hard, and even when they were scary, that I had to step up to the plate and do them. Now, I've practiced that many times over and over again in my lifetime. I practiced it when I had to say goodbye to my grandmother on her deathbed, when I had to tell her it was okay for her to go, when I had to tell her I would be okay. I had to practice it again when I told my dad that he had cancer, and again when his cancer returned and only this time there was nothing the doctors could do for him. It was a hard lesson, but one that I'm so grateful for her for teaching me. The Wabanaki people have relied on that same uh, resiliency for centuries. In the year 1600, the population totaled right around 32,000. A hundred years later, we were down to about 10,000 people. We suffered many epidemics, went through many diseases. We suffered loss upon loss, and yet we're still here. The Penobscot Nation still lives today near Bangor, even after a Massachusetts state governor issued a scalping proclamation in, in 1694 that I'm sure was intended to wipe them out. With one swipe of a quill in 1892, a Maine court decided that the, declared that the Passaquoddy tribe no longer existed. That same court went further to say that we hadn't, we, and took away our hunting and fishing rights and forced a reliance on state subsidies. Even with all of those challenges, and even with all of those intentions for us to disappear, 12,000 years later, the Passamaquoddy tribe still has a language and still has traditions that we celebrate today. When I think about how we've survived centuries of losses and trauma, I believe it is because of our willingness to share and support each other in times of crisis. That was our primary survival technique when uh, we were affected by smallpox in our community. When the epidemic became evident, it didn't take long for our ancestors to realize that the tribe was at risk. So they instituted one of the earliest quarantines and sequestered all of those that were sick onto a nearby island. Most of those people, all of those people actually, died on that island, isolated and alone. It was a sacrifice that they made for the tribe. I spent a number of years as health director in my community. Part of my responsibility was to develop health care programs. In 1996, we decided we were going to apply for a system of care grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. As part of that planning process, I, I, grabbed a, I gathered a group of elders to help us through that planning process. I wanted to be sure that we developed a system that was reflective of Passamaquoddy values. Over a lot of discussion and a lot of sharing and a lot of storytelling, we identified one story and that let, gave us that guidance that we wanted and also our name, Gamikwida Hazultipin. Gamikwida Hazultipin is the Passamaquoddy word for we collectively remember. And it stemmed from a memory from those elders of a time when there was a family in crisis that um, almost a, a response team would go to them. A number, a group of men sometimes, and women would go into that home, move in with them. They would offer them comfort, they would offer them counsel, they would cook, they would clean, they would tend the kids. They would do what needed to do, they needed to do in order to help that fa family get back on their feet. Once they were stabilized, then they would leave and life would go back to normal. That is the characteristic strength of the Passamaquoddy tribe. That is what has allowed us that strength to survive all of those epidemics. And that is the same strength that we have lent to this state and to this country. Native Americans as a whole have the highest rate of enlistment in the military than any other race. We've had Passamaquoddies that fought in the Revolutionary War and every subsequent war thereafter. We fought for freedom even when ours was being stifled. 
Today in 2012, we're still struggling for survival. The Wabanaki people have a life expectancy of 62.4 years, I'm sorry. And uh, in my community, we're not even living that long. The average age of death is 49 years. It's sad to think that Wabanaki people have the health status that, uh, similar to that of a third world country. A lot of those health, those health disparities exist for a number of reasons. You know, we have high rates of um, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, respiratory illness. You name it, we have more of it, two to four times more so often. And it's, it's because of a number of different factors. You know, one of the most evident is probably um, access to health care. People are often under the assumption that the federal government or the Indian Health Service provides for health care for American Indian people, when in reality they only receive less than 50% level, uh, level of funding needed in order to support those services. So every day there's a lot of health care needs that go unmet. The other contributing factor that factors are social determinants like lifestyle, uh, education levels, uh, economic status. Probably the most, um, the largest contributing factor is lifestyle and lifestyle choices. Now it's easy to sit back and say that people can make better choices, but when realistically, how much choice do you have when you're living in poverty? How much choice do the people in my community have when 60% of them earn less than $25,000 a year? On both the Passamaquoddy Reservation, there's an unemployed rate of 65%. Now, when you read articles on, online and you see the comments that go along with those, you know, there are a lot of people across the state that will contribute that to laziness or um, a dependency on welfare. And my response to that is maybe a little. I think the real contributing factor is a level of hopelessness. We simply don't have enough jobs on the reservation for everyone. And we've had community me tribal members that have applied for jobs in surrounding communities. They've applied and applied and applied over and over again without success. After a while, they just give up. It saddens me to think the amount of racism and oppression that exists in our state today. It remains that large elephant in the room that people still choose to ignore. So with health challenges and disparities that are so great in our communities, of course we're going to take opportunities when they come. Sometimes those opportunities take the form of casino campaigns or even more recently, Alvar fishing licenses. And for the record, I want to say, we don't intend to change uh, main living by supporting gambling. And we don't intend to um, kill off all the Alvars in our watersheds. Our goal is always the bottom line that we need jobs. We need economic growth. We need to be able to address the disparities that are killing us. It is our intent to seize those opportunities when they come forward so that we can inspire hope, so that we can make the change that's desperately needed to improve the quality of life for Passamaquoddy people. To me, it's even much more simpler than that. It comes down to one simple desire for me. I want my children to have the opportunity to live as long as your children. I want my grandchildren to be able to live as long as your grandchildren. It's that simple. So I invite you to learn about the Wabanaki people. I, I ask you to remember the good neighbors that we've been and to share in the beauty of our traditions that have fostered all of that resiliency for centuries. But more importantly, I ask you to join me in honoring my grandmother's legacy to acknowledge that elephant that's in the room. Together, we can drag it out and set it free once and for all. And at that point, we can all heal. And at that point, we can be better neighbors for each other. So I'm asking you to pick up a piece of the sky with me, to join the Wabanaki tribes in their quest for self-determination while making Maine a better place for all of us. Thank you.